What do you do if your spouse says, I don't love you anymore? Oh, I know it hurts, but is it time to panic? We think not. Over decades, we have worked with so many couples where that very statement was made, and these couples are now very much in love and very much together. We can teach you a way to bring love back to life. This is Relationship Radio, an extension of Marriage Helper International, hosted by renowned marriage and relationship expert, Dr. Joe Beam, and CEO of Marriage Helper, Kimberly Beam Holmes. We answer your questions directly with research-based principles that you can implement immediately. Regardless of the situation, what we teach will not only make your relationships better, but will also help you to become the best version of yourself along the way. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to turn on notifications. Turn up the volume and prepare to take notes as we begin this week's episode of Relationship Radio. I'm Dr. Joe Bean with MH International, and this beautiful young woman is Kimberly Holmes. She is our CEO, the leader of our organization. Kimberly has trained in marriage counseling and in psychology and is currently working on a PhD in psychology. So Kimberly, is it panic time when another person looks at you and says, I don't love you anymore? Does that mean it's gone and never coming back? No, it does not mean that it's gone and never coming back. Now, I can't guarantee that, but what we know about love is that it's actually something that can be built or rebuilt. Actually, at Marriage Helper, we believe there's a process to falling in love. We call it the love path. Mm -hmm. And we know that when people follow this process, they can fall in love or back in love. Mm -hmm. And so even just that has given so many people hope of realizing there's things I can do. Love isn't just happenstance. It isn't just, I've either found my soulmate or haven't. It's not something that if it's lost, it's gone forever. It's really something that can be rebuilt. And several decades ago, research really showed this as well when, when researchers began to look at what is it that makes up love? And there are three components of the research we follow when it looks at what love is that, that's really good. And we know that when people work on these three areas, it can help to rebuild love or help people to fall more in love and keep love stronger as long as you have the commitment to doing so. Yeah, Dr. Robert Sternberg, an amazing researcher and a brilliant, brilliant man, pointed out that, that love between like a man and a woman has basically three components. Commitment that Kimberly just men mentioned, which is uh, I'll do whatever it takes to keep the relationship alive. And then it has intimacy, which has to do with openness and transparency, vulnerability mm -hmm. into me see and then passion which has to do not just with sex but a craving for oneness with the other person and so when your spouse looks at you and says i don't love you anymore then basically what he or she is saying is at least one of those three components if not all three at least one of those three components have devolved in other words, rather than continuing to grow and develop, which we hope happens in relationships, it actually turned for some reason and went the other way. Now, does that mean it will last a lifetime? As Kimberly just said, no. Could it last a lifetime? Sure, it's possible. But because of the fact we understand the components of love, if you do certain things correctly, you have a good shot at redeveloping the intimacy and the commitment and the passion that Sternberg talks about. Now, the one you should worry least about right now is the passion. And we'll explain more about that in a few minutes. The thing you have to think about first is how do you redevelop intimacy and how can you redevelop commitment? Now, we'll explain that a little bit more as we go through the program. And at the end of the program, we'll tell you about a couple of things we have that can help you do that, that can guide you to the process. As long as you understand this, and Kimberly will elaborate on it in just one second, and that's this. The only person you can change is you. So, Kimberly, if I'm the only person I can change, how can that lead to my spouse falling in love with me again? You know, several years ago, actually, when when my husband, Rob and I went through the marriage helper workshop, we, we were at that time graphing these triangles of love. And I remember, you probably remember this, that you had Rob and I take these assessments to see, I get, 
it, it didn't do this, but it, it tracked us. And so the way I'm going to say it is to see how much in love we were with each other. That's not really what it was, but, but we were able to see where each of us were on this graph. And I remember when I saw his graph, I was thinking of him and I saw it and it was, there were some areas that were lower than what I would have wanted them to be. And immediately I went into why did you say that? Why don't you think more of me in this area? Why aren't you? But that's what we do. So much of the time we are focused on what does my spouse think of me? Why, why aren't they rating me higher? So to say, why don't they change their minds? Why don't they change? But in reality, the only thing that we can do is focus on me. When, if I look at my graph, so to say, then I can see where am I failing in commitment? Am I? Do I need to do more to stay committed to this relationship? Am I being intimate with my husband? Am I? Do I feel like I can be open and vulnerable and transparent? Or if I'm really low in that, then what can I do to do more of that so that we can build that trust? Or passion, if that's low, then it, it really starts to become a gauge of what can I do to help us grow in love in our relationship. Now, we don't track that in the way that, that Sternberg set up the model several years ago anymore because people at the workshop were doing just exactly what I did with my husband. And this was before we were married. Yeah, I, thought, so you can... I thought that engagement was over that day. <laughs> <laughs> and so we see now why we don't do it, but that's the truth of it. There are so many things in our relationships that we put the expectation on our spouse to change or fix. When in reality, there are so many things we should be doing now that could end up making the relationship better over time. Right. And that's the only thing we can control. Exactly. Our friend Alan Chemlin wrote a song years ago that Bonnie Raitt first recorded and over 50 more artists have covered since then called I Can't Make You Love Me. Is that right? I Can't Make You Love Me? Am I getting the title right? Beautiful, wonderful song. And Alan is exactly right. You can't make the other person love you. And by the way, Alan is a tremendous human being. I mean, really a neat guy. But you can do things that will influence the other person in such a way that it will lead them to love you. Now, not because you're doing some kind of magic incantation, not because you're doing any kind of manipulation. No, no, no. If you've got to manipulate somebody to care about you, how do you keep them caring about you? But there are things that you can do that not only develop your own feelings of intimacy, commitment, and passion toward the other, but as a result of how you do that will very strongly influence the other person to increase the intimacy, passion, and commitment they feel toward you. It's what we call a pull. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go through this program. But understand that it's not time to panic or give up when the other person says, I don't love you anymore. So Kimberly, let's go to a couple of questions people sent about that. My husband got involved in an emotional affair. He told me that the reason he had the affair was because he felt neglected after we had our son. He said that he feels empty inside. He's not sure if he still loves me and is uncertain about whether or not he wants our marriage to continue. How should I handle this? As we were listening to this question, I personally remembered of when my husband and I brought our two kids home from India. This was two and a half years ago now. But the first day that we were back in America, back in our home, I remember that day I woke, I woke up at 4 a.m. to two little kids running around the house, took every pot and pan out of the kitchen, turning off and on every light. And that day, I remember sitting in the bathroom floor and crying to my husband saying, things are never going to be the same. <laughs> and that day I felt very depressed. And there was kind of this sense of what have we done? And I love my children, but when you have kids, everything changes. You know this to be true. I now know this to be true. And so there is a sense once you have kids that you have lost yourself. There's a fear of losing your identity. And so I, there's part of it that I know is playing into this for, for this man as well of things have changed. Things are different now. And how can I still have my own identity? So the fact that the stress comes with the child, plus there's another thing it's well known in the marriage industry that sometimes one of the first major crises that will happen with a marriage is the birth of the first child. And in the marriage industry, we say it this way. Now, understand, you know, we kind of joke with each other, etc. We say, well, it's because you changed babies. <laughs> now, understand, we're being a little humorous with that. But what it means is this. The husband that used to get all that attention 
Now a lot of that's focused on the child. And even though the husband loves the child, the father, he loves the child, there's also often a little jealousy in there that he can't afford to tell anybody because he makes him sound like some kind of a jerk. But wait a minute, this child is supplanting me. You're paying more attention to him or her than you are to me. Now that doesn't justify him having, you know, an emotional affair with somebody else. What we're trying to set up here is to understand how that kind of thing can happen. Now think about the emotional confusion that comes with that. Okay, I have this child that I've been looking forward to. We've been pregnant for a while. We've made everything ready. Now the child is born and wow, stress. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that cartoon, Kimberly, it's a meme on the internet, that the couple's leaving the hospital with a newborn and they're asking the doctor, now what time should we make the baby up every morning? And the reason that's hilarious is you've ever had a child is because you know that it's not going to work that way. You don't have to wait. It's going to work just the opposite to that. And so the stress of all that being supplanted a little bit, not having the attention of your spouse. And if somebody else pays attention to you, it doesn't make it right to have an emotional affair. But he got involved in that and all this confusion going on. Now he ends that. You don't expect his emotions to instantly straighten out. And so to look at his wife and say, you know, I don't know if I love you anymore. Or I don't love you anymore. I feel empty inside actually is very understandable. He probably is feeling empty inside because he doesn't know what he feels. He's not even sure anymore what he wants to feel. And so at least the guy is being honest with you. Kimberly, am I on track with that or not? You know, I'm thinking about what our friend David Matthews says and how he talks about how when people go through grief, and I'll relate this back, when people go through grief, it's really just a loss. Whenever someone has experienced a loss of any kind, grief can be associated with it. And with those losses, so loss of your independence, loss of life before kids, loss of the emotional affair, I'm wondering how much this man is also experiencing loss mm -hmm. and therefore he doesn't know what to do because that mm -hmm. adds even more confusion. Your emotions are even more messed up because you're looking for something to fulfill you and you're very confused as to what that is. So feeling some degree, even of grief of what he's lost, but again, not being able to say that out loud because it makes him sound like a jerk. Right. Okay. What do you mean? You've got this beautiful young baby boy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we're trying to say to you is that don't panic that he feels this way. Now, I know it hurts and I know it's scary, but at the same time, this is more than likely a temporary situation, just as the emotional affair, apparently based on what you said, uh, was a temporary situation. And can this work out? Yes. Can that love come back? Understand that what we're looking at here is still a kind of love, but it's faded. So the intimacy between the two of you, we're not talking about sex, but the fact that you talk and share, I imagine is getting interrupted by a newborn baby being around. And so the intimacy gets affected negatively. The passion, well, it takes a while to get back in shape. And so maybe that's affected some. I'm talking about the sexual side of passion now and, and to be able to do to unite with each other like that without pain and those kinds of things. Or even if you do get to that point where you can actually resume your sex life right in the middle of everything is when the baby starts crying again. And so passion can be developed again. That's the one least worry about. It's one that takes care of itself. Mostly intimacy is probably being affected because of the fact that you're not having the time with each other you've had before. And so if the intimacy is being affected, actually it's moving away from love, but is it turning into hate? Now understand that love and hate are not opposites. I'm going to talk about hate a little bit more after we answer the next question that actually the opposite of love is indifference. Okay. Love and hate are parallels. So if you're losing intimacy, it doesn't mean that he's necessarily coming to hate you, but it is meaning he's becoming more indifferent about you, but that mm -hmm. indifference can change by changing some of what's happening in your situation. One thing as you were speaking that I thought of as well is I wonder the wife who's asking this question, if she feels indifferent in any of these areas, uh -huh. because just thinking personally as, as a mom, Sometimes you're so stressed and overwhelmed and you've spent so much time with the kids that she may not 
want to spend time with her husband, not because she doesn't want to be with him, but because she's just wanting some time for her, (laughs) that she's needing some alone time. So I think there's a question that comes in there of how are you managing that? How are you managing to get your time for yourself while also being able to prioritize your marriage, which is hard. You've got to figure out that balance, especially with a newborn, but it's something that's important. Okay. So in answer to your question, what should I do? Number one, don't panic. (laughs) Don't panic. This is a natural part of life. I know it's scary and all those things we talked about earlier, but don't panic and listen to the answer we get to the next question, because some of what we're going to say in response to that one will be applicable to you. Ways that you can reintroduce intimacy, meaning the openness, transparency, vulnerability, not the sex, but the intimacy about being into me see and can begin to redevelop the commitment. But first, let's listen to that second question and then kind of answer both your questions together. My husband said that he's not in love with me anymore. He doesn't want to reconcile or go to the marriage helper workshop. We still sleep in the same bed. We still talk and even laugh together. We are five months into this. There is no affair partner. And we have two kids aged three and four. We hear you when he says he's not in love with you and that he says he's unhappy. Now, happy is the least thing to worry about right now because happiness is based on what's happening. Therefore, happiness can change on any given day or even a few times during a day based on circumstances. So the fact that he says he's not happy is not something we would recommend that you focus on. Now you say, but he says he's not in love with me yet. He doesn't want to reconcile. And when you say reconcile, I assume you mean by that, that he's going to commit to be there with you because apparently he's still living in the same house, sleeping in the same bed. You're talking to each other. You're laughing with each other. And so when you say reconciliation or he's not willing to reconcile, my assumption is that means he's not committing to stay in the marriage right now. And then you've asked him to come to our workshop. Good for you. We would hope that he would come, but don't push that. Now, let's tell you kind of the good and the bad of what's going on in your situation that also ties back to the first caller. I introduced the concept of hate a minute ago, and I know that seems so out of context when we're talking about my spouse says he doesn't love me. Understand that that does not necessarily mean that a kind of hate has come into play. But if you look at Sternberg's same model about love, which is intimacy, commitment, and passion, then a lack of intimacy is what Sternberg would actually call a cool hate. In other words, we're not really being open and transparent and vulnerable to each other anymore. And therefore, the person begins to pull away from me because we don't have the conversations we used to have, meaning the person doesn't feel I truly listen as much. The person doesn't feel I understand as much. Now, so the person that wrote that first question, are you seeing how this also applies to you? Your husband may feel very much now that you don't understand him because you're not listening. You're not trying to comprehend. You're paying too much Mm. attention to that baby. And right now in this situation, it's the similar thing to reintroduce intimacy means that you become an open book and that whenever the other person wants to talk, you truly listen. You don't say, I don't have time right now. Oh, wait a minute. We got to go check on the baby. We got to do this. You pay attention and make that person special. Listen, try to understand his or her emotions, validate those emotions. Don't argue. Don't try to correct them. If he were to say, for example, I I miss making love to you. Don't go, don't you understand how tired I am with this baby? Instead, what you say is "I, I miss it too. help me understand what it would mean to you when we can do that again, or what it does can do for you. If if we learn how to do it even better right now, you try to rebuild the intimacy, then the commitment commitment tends to go away when we start seeing the person as being different than what we thought they were before. Like I thought you were the person fulfilling my needs. I thought you were the person who thinks like me, feels like me, acts like me, that we had enough similarity that, that we were on par. We were peers with each other. But now I'm seeing you as somebody different, somebody who doesn't fit into my world anymore. And if I see you as somebody who has changed and not the same person that fits into my world, my commitment begins to devolve. It can finally get so bad. It's what's called a cold hate. In other words, I don't feel any tremendously strong passion against you. It's just that I don't have anything for you because you're now so different than what you used to be. Up there with the cool hate, when intimacy is moving away, again, there's not a lot of emotion in that, but the person is moving away from you because they tend to be looking for it someplace else. And when they look for it someplace else is when they might be having the emotional affair and et cetera. 
Now, don't worry about the passion right now. Both of these questions indicate people that don't have strong negative passion. Because if they were strong negative passion, you'd be hearing a lot about either how much afraid of you they are, or more likely, how angry with you they are. And that's what's called a hot hate. And when that exists, you know it exists. Now, if I'm confusing you on all this, understand that right now we're working on a product that we expect to have out. It's going to be seven videos, and they're going to be 18 or so minutes each, approximately. And I'm going to be explaining the difference in love and hate and how to rebuild love, even if you believe the other person hates you. Not available today, but it will be out in a couple of months. If you understand what I just said, understand that. The fact that they are beginning to feel indifference towards you, which is what you're both describing, means that love is actually moving away. You're losing intimacy. You're losing commitment and probably passion. So what this can mean for you as a woman, as a mom, as a wife, trying to figure out all of these things, it goes back to what we teach about the pies, this concept of how you can become the most attractive that you can be, which is the first step to falling back in love with your spouse and your spouse falling back in love with you. So what does that mean? That means physically do something to make sure you're taking care of yourself. Sleep. That sounds crazy especially with a newborn, but you've got to figure out time to sleep, eat right, especially if your sleep isn't good, then you even more need to prioritize your exercise and your eating. That's crucial. Intellectually do things to get your mind on an adult level. You know what I mean by that? You, you're you around a kid all day long. Do things to read some books, watch documentaries, take a course online, do something that gives you that sense of you back emotionally, this is connecting. It could be connecting with your husband, doing the things that Joe was just talking about, or even connecting with your girlfriends, calling them up, keeping that sense of community around you. And then spiritually remembering there's more to your current situation. So if you're a spiritual person of, of faith, of the Christian faith, pray, read your Bible. But even if you're not volunteering, doing something to give back to the community is a great way to get out of your own mind and out into the bigger world that's going on around you. So those are some ways that you can begin working on becoming the best that you can be, even in the situation that you're in right now. Now, if they want to know more about these pies, this physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual that you're talking about, how would they do that? The best way to learn more about the pies is by going to marriagehelper.com and getting our Art of Attraction Toolkit. In there, we're going to be talking about every single area of the pies. It's a great place to start. Another way that you can go and do that is by listening to the It Starts With Attraction podcast, which is the podcast that I do. I have interview-based ones, different things. All of it is about each of these area of the pies. Also, in relation to what we have been talking about on today's episode, I did an episode with Joe a couple of months ago it, what is love? We, so we talked about what is love. We broke down many components of it, talked about it more in depth. We'll link to that in the show notes as well so that you can head over and learn even more about love. And we don't just talk about it in the relationship sense. We talk about it in, in the sense of culturally, what is love? How can we love people when they disagree with us or when they have different beliefs than us? It's really powerful and impactful. So I would recommend that you go and listen to that as well. So in other words, you start with you, your own physical, intellectual, emotional, spiritual. And whatever you do, don't try to manipulate your spouse. Don't try to force him into anything at this point. Don't even be begging like, I wish you loved me. You see that child here? We made that child together. You should love me and love this child. And all those things will work against you. You work on becoming the best you can possibly be. And those are some great resources as to how to do that. And when you do, that's the kind of influence that can lead your husband because he, both these were from wives, but your wife, if you're listening in your mail, it can lead them to you to where they'll love you again. Love can grow. And sometimes it ebbs and flows. Sometimes it ebbs and flows, but there's actually a love path that you can follow. And of course, on our website, marriagehelper.com, you can find a lot more about our resources. Or if you want to call our office at 866-903-0990, you can talk to one of our client representatives who can help you understand about all the things that we offer for you. So Kimberly, it's now time for our key takeaway from this episode. The first key takeaway in order of importance is to remember that 
working on you and becoming the best that you can be in the areas of physical, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually, but also in the areas of love is the best thing that you can do for your relationship now. So how can you do that? Number two, focus on becoming open and vulnerable, trusting and transparent with your spouse, making time to spend with your spouse, because that will make a difference and help you to grow a relationship. But another part of this is make a commitment to do it. A huge part of love is commitment. And what's scary is that we are in an era of society right now that is moving away from commitment and moving towards individual expressivism, which is what, what the social sciences are calling it, which basically means I'm going to do what makes me happy. Do what's best for the relationship and do what's best for your family. Mm -hmm. And the third key point is to remember that you can always start this process at the beginning. If you feel like you've gotten to the end of the day and you totally blew it, guess what? You can start back over. It's always something that is there for you to keep following. You're never going to perfect it. You're always going to be working at it, but you will be getting better every single day. And as you're being open and transparent and vulnerable, please allow your spouse to do the same. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to develop the intimacy within them. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being part of this episode of Relationship Radio. Let me mention what we'll be talking about next time. What should you do if you get caught cheating? Run? Hide? Lie? Or try to resolve the marriage? And if so, is that possible? Is there a way it can be done? So whether you have cheated or your spouse has cheated, you're going to find a lot of answers in the next episode of Relationship Radio. We look forward to seeing you there. I had been going to counseling and I had been, you know, talking about, you know, our marriage and, um, and feelings I had for, for somebody else and that I never acted on or anything, but I, that I had. And, um, and I just kept telling my, my counselor how miserable I was. And, uh, and she just kind of looked at me and said, well, you're pretty much trapped, aren't you? And I, <laughs> I was like, okay, that's not super helpful, you know? <laughs> um, but I was, I was a pastor and I felt like I was in a bad marriage. I felt like, how do I, how do I, who do I go to? Um, I'm the one people come to. And it led to a night out uh, without Ashley that um, I told my feelings to that person that I had feelings for. Um, but I started a fair, a six week or 12 week affair, um, six of it secretly. And then, you know, six more kind of open. We got caught. Um, and um, and so at that point, you know, it was like, finally, um, we got caught, you know, it was, it was like a relief, you know, cause the world would say, Oh no, you'd be mean to this person or you make them jealous. And like, that just didn't make sense to me. And so to like, um, I Googled exactly how to save my marriage when the spouse wants out. I just kept saying, as long as I do these things, it should work, right? If anything will, this will. And so I'm just going to do what they say because I've heard stories of people before me who've done the same things. And I think I cried for three hours. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is bad. And no wonder he wants to leave. That's how I felt. You know, finding you guys was uh, obviously, I think what, what saved our, our marriage and the, the empowerment that she had and her ability to stand up uh, when everyone else was telling her to, to get lost and she lost friends over it and, you know, lost a, a lot of people uh, because she just kept loving me. It was like, uh, like, oh, a, didn't know that you could have a marriage like that. Right. You know, like, You just, you always want to be married to your best friend or, you know, someone that you enjoy life with. And it was awesome. <laughs> it is awesome. From my, the lives of my children, um, my career, passion, my marriage, um, it's all owed to Marriage Helper. You know, just that it's it's what gave Ashley strength to put up with um, all of my nonsense and through my depression to not give up on me. 
even when I was just hoping she would. It was everything, and I felt like I deserved to be given up on. Anybody that's having any kind of issues, I've, I, I did, that's where I point them. I just, I just point them at you guys. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Relationship Radio. Please refer to the notes in the description to learn more about any resources mentioned in this episode. Please visit our website at marriagehelper.com for more information about our online courses, marriage workshops, and coaching. If you would like immediate help for your marriage situation, then click on the link on the screen to schedule a free marriage strategy call with one of our team members. We exist to help save marriages and strengthen families. We look forward to interacting with you on the next episode of Relationship Radio.